Okay, this month we are taking a look at the SIMD JSON library for parsing JSON into a document structure using SIMD instructions. So, let's just get over here. Okay, so a couple of things we'll be talking about. We'll do a brief, very brief, overview of SIMD. Uh, we'll look at the algorithm that SIMD JSON uses to parse input text into a doc document structure. And we'll take a brief look inside the implementation to see the kinds of things that they are doing to invoke SIMD instructions. And we'll look at how SIMD JSON uses dynamic dispatch to select an implementation to use the most advantageous instruction set extension available for the CPU on which it's executing. Uh, and along the way we'll see how SIMD operations are exposed inside the library. Now what I've done is uh, I've gone out to, this is the website comics.org. It's a open source comic book database. And you can obtain a name value dump from the database as a free download. The data is all uh, Creative Commons licensed. So we can use that as some sample data. I happen to know there's tons of uh, data inside there. Let's just take a quick look. So over here, I have downloaded the name value form of the database. That is one gigabyte of text for the issues. Each publication is considered an issue. And then within each issue, there are sequences. So, for instance, there's a sequence for the cover, and then there's a sequence for each comic story that appears inside that has different credits. So there may be a, <coughs> you know, say a multi-part story, and one part is written by written penciled and inked and colored by one set of artists, and then the second part is written penciled and inked by a second set of artists and so on. So there is uh, can be multiple sequences inside an issue. So there's when you get that name value dump, you get two tab separated value files, one for the issues and one for the sequences. And if we take a look at what they look like, it's text. And there are tab characters separating the fields and all the fields are uh, given as quoted strings, even if they are numbers or booleans and the way this uh, data is structured is there's an ID as the first field the second field is second field in the tab separated value so I guess it's the second value the second value in the TSV file is the field name associated with the ID that is the first value and then the third value in the tab separated value is the value associated with the field. So it's ID, field name, and value. And you can see that um, here's all the fields for ID 1 in the database for the issues file. And then here's all the fields for ID 2 and so on. For the um, sequences tab separated value. It's similar, except now there's an extra value in the tab separated value records. So each line is a record. And the first field is the associated issue number. And then the second field is the sequence number within the issue. And then subsequent records indicate the other <coughs> the other uh, name value pairs associated with that sequence associated with an issue. So 
I wrote a little program to convert those tab separated value files to JSON files and they look like this where I've got might be hard to see but that's an open square bracket so this is an array of objects each object corresponds in the uh, each object in the issues JSON corresponds to a single issue and then it's name value pairs and the only translation that I've done on the values is if the value was true or false I converted that to a JSON true or false instead of keeping it as a string I didn't convert any of the numbers to numbers I didn't uh, try to interpret their SQL schema from the uh, name value TSV dump I, I just everything is a string <coughs> unless it was the strings false or true and then those are converted to boolean json booleans so how many records are we talking about well in the tsv uh, 2 million 2.8 million lines so 6753222 I guess that's 28 million lines 28 million lines so pretty big file they're uh, one gigabyte text files so I have a one I turned this TSV that's a 1.08 gigabytes I turned it into a JSON file that's 1.06 gigabytes and for the sequences TSV which was 1.18 gigabytes it turned into a JSON file that is 1.08 gigabytes uh, the JSON for the sequences is a little bit smaller because um, we take a look at that sequences JSON um, the <coughs> sequence number is present here just once and even though these field names are uh, present uh, it just ended up being a little bit more compact and I, I printed it out in a nice human readable form here when I converted it and I've written a little program called print comics if I just run it with no arguments here it'll tell me what you want this is basically a query against this JSON data so give it the directory where the issues and sequences JSON files are located and I can do a query for either a script credit a pencilers credit or an inker credit or a colorist credit so we'll just look at the output of this first before we look at some code so I've got the JSON files in the current directory and um, I'm not doing a case insensitive match but I know that there's a writer Mark Grunwald who wrote a bunch of stuff and if I run this you can see it's reading the JSON files it read them pretty quickly and then it spits out a whole bunch of issue and sequence data that matches you can just control C that so you can just kind of get a glimpse here so here was um, an issue official handbook of the Marvel Universe deluxe edition number six <coughs> where Mark Grunwald wrote many of the sequences in that issue so for each sequence I'm printing out the title the feature associated with the sequence and then the script pencils inks and colors credits if they exist and you can see that Mark Grunwald names appears on every one of these script credit lines so that's just an, my my little example um, so let's dig into how this works so th this is a SIMD library so we're just looking at the SIMD page on Wikipedia just so I don't have to make these diagrams since Wikipedia already has them and as the name implies single instruction multiple data we're talking a single CPU instruction that operates on multiple data elements in parallel so in this example uh, we've got SIMD registers that hold multiple values in a single register you uh, apply an operation and the two registers containing multiple values in this case there are multiple values of the same size it's possible to do some limited number of operations that mix operations of different sizes but usually the SIMD, op SIMD instructions 
are operating on multiple registers where the registers hold multiple values all of the same size and so in this case they're doing a multiply so 5 times 3 is 15 9 times 3 is 27 2 times 3 is 6 8 times 3 is 24 and the uh, two you know, multiply as an instruction typically takes two input operands and an output operand so they're specifying different registers two different registers as the input operands and a third register as the output operand and all of these operations happen in parallel so we can get four-way parallelism for a multiply operation and complete four data units of multiply in one instruction execution time now how many cycles that is depends on the different CPUs and you know the instruction set architecture and so on but we can get four-way data parallelism, parallelism assuming we get four data values to fit into a register now over time different CPU architectures have had different SIMD instruction different SIMD extensions to their instruction sets so it started out in the 90s with MMX which was integer math only 8-bit uh, and 16-bit quantities and then later you got SSE this so-called streaming SIMD extensions and then there was SSE 2 and then there were I think there was an SSE 3 and at this point we're up to a whole bunch of different instruction extensions instruction set extensions Let's see if they have it here on this little table no they just have we're just on the generic page for SIMD uh, if we go over here and look at say SSE and this is the streaming SIMD extensions and then we come down here now this little table is showing you these different extensions so MMX in 96 uh, 3D now which I believe came from AMD and then SSE in 99 SSE 2 SSE 3 SS SSE 3 SSE 4 and then AVX is a more recent one from in 2008 and then there's AVX 2 in 2013 AVX 512 in 2015 and so on now if you were to write assembly language code to deal with all these different instruction set extensions when you write in assembly language it's up to you to manage which registers are being used each of these different instructions uh, set extensions each while each one didn't necessarily introduce their own registers there are uh, registers that were added to the x86 uh, the Intel instruction set there were registers that were added for MMX and there were registers that were added for SSE and then different uh, subsequent instruction set extensions extended the number of registers and or extended their width made them wider wider registers mean they can handle more data units of the same size or they can handle larger data units in parallel so up to the point where we are now where not only integer operations of 8 16 or 32 bits or 64 bits can be handled in parallel you've also got single precision floating point and double precision floating point operations that can be handled in parallel now the JSON parser doesn't use any of the floating point operations it's only using integer operations but um, in, in the fully general case if you're you know wanting to exploit SIMD you may have a floating point algorithm and be able to take advantage of the single and double precision floating point so that's just kind of SIMD as a quick overview and you might if you go to simdjson.org you can see um, how, you know some uh, the landing page for this library this library is used in quite a bit of uh, production code in terms of uh, web infrastructure because there's a lot of data being sent around over HTTP based APIs in JSON format um, both uh, 
common services like Twitter, but also services like GitHub and uh, various internal uh, services to uh, corporations and so on. All kinds of uh, APIs are being exposed where the data that you send is sent up in JSON format. People are preferring JSON these days over XML. XML was popular in the early days of the web, but it's out of favor now. People generally prefer JSON. So that means if you want to obtain a high transaction rate on your web-based API, you need to parse many, AP, many transactions that have JSON inputs. And it's entirely possible that you may need to parse a large amount of JSON, not just many documents, but large single documents, uh, which is the case in our little database dump here. And the way that the this uh, library approaches it is kind of interesting because it's basically a two-phase operation where the first phase they scan through the text and mark out all the interesting bits in the input and for JSON the interesting bits are the characters that are used to separate the syntactical elements inside a JSON string. If we go look at json.org you can see, uh, let's see if we can make this a little, yeah. they've done it in such a way that I can't make it smaller. But in JSON, things are either an object or they are an array, a, an object of name value pairs or an array of values. And a value can be either an object or another array or it can be a number, a boolean or a string or null. So a value can be string, number, object, array, true or false, or no. And a string has a specific allowed content. Uh, it can be UTF-8. So any Unicode code point except double quote or backslash or specific control characters. Uh, so if you need to include a, a, a double quote, that you can escape a double quote. You can escape a backslash if you need to have a backslash in your string. Also, backspace, form, feed line, feed, catch, turn, horizontal tab, those are all allowed as escaped named uh, literals. Or you can escape an arbitrary Unicode character with backslash U and four hex digits. And there's a specific syntax for numbers. And, you know, white space is restricted. So. JSON takes on a specific form, but there are specific magic characters like open curly brace or comma or close curly brace or colon, uh, square brackets, double quotes, double quote opens a string and closes a string. So strings, unlike JavaScript, where a string could be delimited as either single or double quotes in JSON, a string must be enclosed in double quotes, which means if it has a double quote inside it, that double quote has to be escaped. So the job of a JSON parser is to find all these individual elements and validate that the input string follows this. It, it's simple, but this specification for what is valid JSON and then produce some kind of representation of the document. Now, uh, most APIs, you know, they are scanning character by character on the input string, building objects on the heap that represent uh, the various elements, you know, whether it's an array or whether it's an object or whether it's a string or a number. And SIMD.JSON also builds a document structure, but it is doing things in, in what I think is a novel way for parsing. So, um, as I say, you can go out to the, the, the SIMD JSON uh, landing page. Uh, I guess that was over here. The SIMD JSON landing page, and if you go over to this uh, software link, you can get over to the documentation on GitHub. It's a project on GitHub, so we're looking at GitHub pages for their project. Um, and the, the documentation is just fine. And also the header files that you include have nice 
explanatory comments inside there for the different methods and so on like that. So the doc there, there's no shortcoming in the documentation. I obtained the library through VC package, just specifying it in my in my manifest. If we go back over here to the source code, I just said I depend on SIMD JSON. Obtained it through a VC package, no problem. Um, so the parsing in SIMD JSON, I think, is interesting because it happens in uh, a w what I thought was a novel way when I read through it. Because I don't normally think of parsing as a parallel activity. Because I think, well, parsing, you know, you can't. If I see a comma character, how do I know if this comma character is inside a string? In order to know if it's inside a string, I have to look at all the characters before that comma, and you know if it's inside of a string then the comma isn't significant in terms of the JSON syntax it's only significant when the comma is separating two values in a JSON array or two key value pairs inside a JSON object so how do you do that in parallel and the answer is I mean they're uh, from the SIMD JSON homepage, you can go and find links to these papers, which you can download and read, and that's, I've just downloaded it and worked to a certain section here. And the way they do it, it, I found interesting because they basically mark all the interesting characters in parallel. So, for instance, on this first line here, they've marked all the backslashes. And backslashes represent a tricky case because if a backslash precedes another backslash, it could be quoting a backslash, as is the case here. So these t first two backslashes, that represents an escaped backslash, and then this backslash quote represents an escaped quote, which means the closing quote for this string is down here, not here. So what they do is they, through a, a clever... Uh, application of bitwise operations and parallel uh, masking of characters they can in this in this first uh, case you know they're marking all the places where uh, backslashes appear and then they've similarly um, got places where they mark where all quotes appear and through a tricky combination of these bit masks they're able to identify all the odd numbers of backslashes so an odd number of backslashes before a double quote means that that double quote is in fact escaped and not marking the end of a string and similarly, they can mark all the other interesting characters in the grammar, like the commas and the square brackets and the curly braces. And combining that information together, they can get um, access to all the interesting stuff in the input string without having to uh, contextually scan everything up to a certain character. So they can uh, get that knowledge in parallel by applying these little bit mask scan and oper scan and uh, combina uh, boolean bit combinations, they can apply that in parallel to all the different chunks, and the only thing they need to do is to uh, sync up some state across chunk boundaries. And in this case, uh, chunks are 64, uh, typically 64 characters at a time, that they can load into one of these SIMD registers, and uh, apply those operations uh, fairly quickly and that's how they're able to get the high parsing rate of gigabytes per second for input text. Um, now the details of these algorithms are explained in these papers so I, and they also have there's multiple videos on SIMD JSON that you can find so I'm, I'm not going to go too into the detail on this we'll look at some code in a second. Uh, another interesting thing that they do is um, they have a SIMD approach for classifying. This is how they're able to quickly identify all the interesting syntactical characters in the input string. 
um, and they're using uh, some limited lookup table capability in SIMD instructions extensions, uh, namely that they can do a table lookup if the table is 16 entries or shorter. And you might think, well, you know, there's kind of 256 entries in a, you know, in a byte. So how are they doing the lookup with only 16 entries? And the answer is that they, they carefully construct um, a classification table using the low nibble and the high nibble of the characters so that um, once they've run it through their classification algorithm, they end up with a bit mask for the different uh, classes, and then they can distinguish the characters that way. Uh, the details, again, are described in these papers that are available online. So let's take a look at some code. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the guts of their library because or the guts of their algorithms, because like I said, it's well covered in their uh, publications that are freely available online. And uh, there's existing um, videos on those topics in detail. So let's, what does it look like to use this? So I've just written a simple, this is my driver program that I ran from the console earlier. And I'm going to uh, build a database from the input directory where my JSON files are located and then do some command line parsing and just call one of these um, methods on the database that prints out these sequences inside uh, prints out all the matching issues for whom the sequence matches the appropriate credit so it's either a script credit or a penciling credit or an inks credit or a colors credit um, these are the four main roles in producing comic book sequences so if we take a look inside here, uh, inside my little create database, this is just all I've done. Let's just go back here and take a look at this. My header file, I just have an abstract interface to my database and a factory function that gives me back a shared pointer implementation. So this is just, uh, you know, type erasure. I'm not exposing my implementation directly. It's only exposed through an abstract interface. My factory function is just invoking the constructor on my implementation of this abstract interface. So what's my abstract or what's my concrete database look like? I am holding a parser and a SIMD JSON result of a SIMD DOM element for both issues and sequences and um, I mentioned that their parsing algorithm was in two phases their first phase is that scan phase that we discussed a little bit the second phase is creating the document object model the DOM that represents the parsed input should the parsed input be valid JSON if the parsed input has some kind of syntactical error the, the uh, parser code will throw an exception so you can't get a malconstructed DOM. You can only get one a, a DOM element constructed for documents that are valid JSON and the furthermore the JSON has to contain valid UTF-8 strings and it has to contain valid numbers and they also have SIMD algorithms for doing UTF-8 validation and uh, numeric conversion. Uh, again you can read the details of those in their papers um, but it's just interesting that they've they've ap aggressively applied SIMD technology to as many parts of the parsing algorithm as possible. Uh, and 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 the the numeric parsing and the UTF-8 validation um, is just kind of interesting how they managed to apply SIMD technology there as well. But the end result uh, from the parser is a a DOM that uh, an element that represents the top level uh, of the document. Now, if you're reading multiple JSON inputs, you need to keep the par lifetime of the parser to be the same as the resulting document that you got. And that's because the parser holds some data structures uh, that are pointed into by the document 
uh, object model that they've produced. So in my constructor, I am uh, just using a directory iterator to scan through that directory and looking for JSON files that end with you know magic strings for the, the, the issue JSON and then I'm going to load that into the parser and get a document out and remember that I saw that and do the same thing for the sequences and just a little sanity check I, I need both of them for things to uh, work well so if I you know I'm just throwing exceptions if the input directory that was given to the program doesn't contain what's expected. Now, um, it turns out that either to, to either do a script match or a pencil match, ink match, and in matching any of these credits, it's just a matter of matching up the given name to a given field on the JSON so we can have a single internal method that does all of that. And now you can start to see what it looks like to start scanning the document. Now, um, if we just let's just take a look really quickly into their header. So, um, if you've dealt with other JSON APIs before, due to the typeless and you know kind of mixed nature of JSON data. It's always possible you can ask the document object model for something that does not exist. So for instance, um, you may ask an object for a key that it doesn't have. Or you may ask an array for an uh, index that it doesn't have, and so on. Or you may be attempting to query a value as a string when it's not a string. So everything in the SIMD JSON library is kind of wrapped up in the SIMD JSON result templated type. And basically this represents something similar to uh, std optional, where a SIMD JSON result holds a, a result and uh, It either holds the thing that is the template type, or it holds an error. Um, so basically, all their query APIs return a SIMD JSON result. There's a way to use this library without exceptions. I've got it with exceptions turned on. So for me, when I ask for things that don't exist, they turn into exceptions. But if I was using the non-exception form, then I could query this result to see if it if it actually had the thing that I expect. So that's what we get back from load on uh, I'm giving it a string that represents a path to a file name. We get back an element and a DOM element. It has a type. It can and then you can start querying inside the element. It could be an object, it could be a null, it could be a boolean, it could be a string, it could be a number, or it could be an array. So when you call these getter methods, to, you know, you say, I've got this thing, I want the object that's inside it. Well, it might have an object or it might have something else. Which is why everything is wrapped up in these SIMD JSON results. And in my code, you'll see that if we go back down here to the little helper that's doing the matching, I am. I happen to know the structure of my document. The structure of my document is that the sequences and the issues are arrays of objects. So I can just do um, get array on the sequences. And if we look at get array, that returns a DOM array, and a DOM array has a begin and end method that return iterate that returns an iterator into the elements in the array. So I can use that straight in a range for loop to iterate over all the elements that are in the array of sequences. And in my case, 
each element it better be an object that's the structure of my input data an array of objects so I'm just doing some sanity checking to say if it's not an object then that's a runtime error something something went badly wrong otherwise I can start iterating over the key value pairs inside the object that represents a single sequence and I can look at this this field name is the name of the field I'm trying to match against a user supplied input right so I'm either gonna match against uh, it's up here I'm either gonna match against the script field the pencils field the inks field or the colors field so I am comparing the key in this name value in this key value pair I'm comparing the key name to the expected field name and if that is the field I'm interested in then I'll go get the value from the field the value better be a string because the credits are all they're not booleans they're all string values so the the credit field value better be a string value then I can call get string on the value to get a string view but it, it's it's wrapped up in the simd json result of a string view so on the json result I can call this method value let's go back to the declaration here so here we are on this is the class that is the simd json result and if we call the value method we get the thing that is wrapped up inside let's go back here so I call get string I get a simd json result of string view I call value that gets me to the string view and then I can look inside the string view to see if the user supplied name is contained within that string view and if it is then it won't be equal to std string and pause and I can get at the object that represents the JSON object that represents this record I can look up the issue number I know that every sequence is associated with an issue number so I don't have to worry about uh, and I know that the issue number is a string so I don't have to worry about it uh, being something other than a string and I know that the value is going to be here so in the normal case with well-formed input data to this program this expression here does not throw an exception I can get that it's a string view and to use s2i I have to use it on a std string not a string view I think that honestly is uh, an oversight in the standard library I wonder if they fix uh, I'm using C++ 17 here the SMD JSON library requires C++ 17 or later and I'm also using std file system which is also C++ 17 I don't know if S2I has been overloaded to handle, uh, to take a string view argument in uh, C20 or 23. Um, hopefully, that oversight will be corrected at some point so we don't have to manually make a std string from a string view just so we can call S2I to get the issue number. And then I've got a map that I've declared up here a map from int to vector of simd json objects so this is a collection of all the sequences for that issue number for which the credit matched and as we saw in the output there can be multiple sequences for a single issue that for which the credit matches so I'm building associated with the issue number a vector of JSON objects that matched on the credit field and then I've just got some printing code here that is going to um, you know do a little fancy formatting it's going to print blank lines between issues the issue title and uh, issue number will be printed against the left and then for each sequence 
with no blank line between the first sequence and the title of the issue. There will be the credits printed out f uh, along with the title and feature for that sequence and all the sequences will be printed with a blank line between each one and it's it's possible that some of these credits might be missing for instance if it's a a black and white comic there's no color credit and the colors field won't appear in the JSON it doesn't appear in the tab separated value data either so it doesn't appear in the JSON so there's a little bit of you know bookkeeping and stuff just going on as we print this out um, the, only, the kind of the interesting part is going on in this print sequence um, here we're doing that check to see if the field is present and if it's not present we're just not going to do anything otherwise we're going to obtain it the sequence is a JSON object the at key method gives you the value at the key for that object uh, we'll do a little sanity check here because I am printing blank spaces to get these fields right justified. I uh, allocated 18 spaces for that, so if the key was longer than 18, then 18 minus key length will be some ridiculously huge number, and that would be bad, so we'll just do a runtime check against that. And here we are, we have the field but the field might not be a string it might be a boolean in my tab separated value to json converter i converted boolean strings false I, I converted the strings false and true to the booleans false and true uh, and i may have done other conversions there's no guarantee that the value at this key is a string so I'm using the query is string tells me if the JSON value is a string if it is I can use get string safely if it's a boolean I can use get pool safely if it's a number I can use get int 64 there's a couple of different ways you can get at the number in a JSON value a JSON value doesn't distinguish between an integer an, an, an integer number or a floating point number both are just considered to be number and because C++ has different types for 64-bit ints and for you know floats and doubles there's different getters in SIMD JSON so I can get it as a int 64 in, in my case I just happen to know I there's no um, floating point numbers that I'm interested in so I'm just gonna get them as as ints um, if it was some other type I don't know what that is so I'm just going to get a um, it's interesting that they didn't provide a, they, they provide this type accessor the type accessor returns a element type enum okay that tells me what kind of type the JSON value is but they don't provide a two string Met, uh, function for the type that I could find they do provide a stream insertion operator um, and so I can get the uh, the type enum as a string I can get it that way and then I can build an appropriate um, exception message uh, and then just gonna you know this is just a convenience lambda that I defined here inside this function and then we're just gonna print out these different fields if they exist so the DOM is pretty full featured well it's completely full featured in terms of JSON right but it's um, it's actually pretty nice in that I can use range for loops Let's go down here. Where's here we go? So I can use range for loops. That's file system for loops. Sorry. Here we go. I can use range for loops to iterate over elements of an array, a JSON array. I can use range for loops to iterate over key value pairs in a JSON object. And um, 
that makes it very simple to treat these JSON collections as natural collections in MyC++. Um, one thing that wasn't obvious to me when I first started coding this was that and it makes sense in hindsight. I just I just didn't think about it when I was initially writing this code. When I was initially writing this, I had the same parser. I was using the same parser to load the two files, and it didn't dawn on me that the parsers have uh, are, are uh, the parsers hold data that is created as a result of the load and is not contained in the resulting DOM element that is returned and that's because the parser acts as a data store and their structure for the DOM uh, returns DOM elements that have indices into the data store and if, if you read the paper on their parsing algorithm that's uh, due to the nature of their parse the, the data structure produced by their parse rather which is that they consider the output of the parse to be what they call a tape and the tape is basically an array of words and they use um, a portion of the word to encode what is the type of the JSON value so when we saw uh, this call to uh, type And we saw that that produced this element type enum. These characters are not arbitrary. It's uh, so when they when they have a 64-bit word in their tape, the top byte of the word represents the type of the element uh, or uh, the value. So it is a literal open square bracket character in the top byte of a tape word that represents the beginning of an array and similar for object the top byte is a literal open curly brace and then L lowercase l for uh, an int 64 T U D so on double quote uh, T for uh, boolean T for true uh, N N for null for uh, a null value and then the lower portion of the 64-bit word that is not consumed by the type is an index into their data store and so for a an array the index points is the index of the word in the tape that represents the end of the array so if you are traversing the DOM and you need to skip over a, an array the DOM traversal can quickly reach the end of the array simply by using that offset into the tape to find the next word after the end of the array. It doesn't need to scan anything. The nested nature of the JSON is all resolved out in the scanning process and uh, when they build the tape traversing the DOM is extremely fast because they've built all these indices ahead of time as a result of the parsing process. Now when it comes to um, the strings and the numbers, they do the number parsing and the UTF-8 validation as a, a separate part of their second phase and um, that results in, uh, I believe they have a separate um, essentially, you know, data store where the, the strings and the string values and uh, the numbers are held because it's the numbers are not kept in character form they've been parsed into you know either a, a double or you know a 64-bit integer but since the words in the tape are 64 bits they can't store the integer in that 64-bit word I believe what they do for the integers and the doubles is it might just be in the in the word following um, and then for strings it's not in the word following I believe it's a, a the, the it's an index into a separate uh, buffer that they're using uh, for the strings um, but that, that's the those just details of their 
internal data structure for the DOM. From, from your point of view as a consumer of the DOM, you don't need to care about any of that. But you do care about the performance of Traversal, and because they've used those indices, Traversal is very fast. And, I mean, you, you saw what I was doing here. I have an array of records, and I'm scanning the array linearly with find if. Uh, well, it's the find if on the key value pairs, but if we go down here, I am doing a linear scan on the, you know, one million or whatever, you know, record set of sequences. And then I gathered up all the, the issues uniquely for the set of sequences. And, but then I'm scanning through the, the, uh, Sorry, down here, I'm, I'm sorting my vector of sequences by sequence number. And then I'm scanning through the issues. Uh, where was I doing that? Oh, no, I see. I knew what I was doing. It's off here in the uh, print issue print issue does a find if on the vector it's really it's a JSON array of JSON objects so I, that's not any you know accelerated data structure I'm, I'm just iterating through the tape and iterating you know it's, it's a linear iteration I you know maybe I could do something smarter if I was gonna do many many queries you build some kind of you know data structure in memory that, you know, a hash tree or whatever that understand as stood map that understands that, you know, there's a bunch of things associated with issue numbers and I might want to look up quickly by issue number. I'm just scanning linearly through this JSON DOM that came back from parsing that gigabyte of text into this tape structure that they've built. And that was fast enough, certainly fast enough for this console program. Um, now, Obviously, if this were, you know, a database that was persistent and had to answer many queries over time, it would make more sense to write something that read this JSON and then implemented it some kind of actual database structure, you know, use the SQL database or whatever, and injected everything into the database using some kind of schema from the JSON and then did all my repeated queries against that database structure. But in my case, I'm doing a single query. It's just that I have to match it against a very large pile of JSON text. And um, SIMD JSON is a good match for that because I can read that text very quickly. If we go back over here to this program, we'll just run it again. Uh, let's just do something that I, you know, I know doesn't match. Uh, oops, wrong date, wrong directory. So read all that stuff in about two seconds, you know, and it wasn't even in a hot part of my file system cache. If I run it again, it might go faster, but probably not. My cache isn't that big. But still, that was, that's pretty fast for reading, you know, two gigabytes of text and turning it into a DOM structure that I can query and my query is stupid. It just iterates over everything linearly. So that meant because it didn't match. It had to iterate over every single element in the DOM, every single record, and do string compares against a bunch of fields within those JSON objects to find their appropriate credit field, and then do another string compare against the credit field to find out that the value didn't match. And it did that for every single record in the DOM of sequences. It didn't do anything with the DOM of issues because nothing matched. It only uses the issue DOM when there are matching elements from the sequence DOM. So, a um, couple more interesting implementation things to look at. Let's now run this in the debugger. I've got some breakpoints preset. Because there's a couple things we haven't talked about yet. So here I am. I'm about to load. I'm about to use my parser for the very first time to do some JSON loading. And if I continue in, we get down here, 
and the first thing it does is get a list of available CPU implementations and to do that uh, or sorry when it does that it builds a list of all the CPU implementations that the library knows about so that's all the instruction set extension variants that it knows how to handle if th this library it can be com it's pretty flexible in terms of how you build it as well as um, how you use it so um, let me just get this back on screen here in case I can see chat uh, question in the chat I wonder if the internal C string call in S2I requires null termination which isn't guaranteed with string view S2I is in the C++ standard library and takes a std string so it does not require that the string be null terminated if I used A2I from the C library then you would have to guarantee that the string is null terminated I'd have to take the string view convert it to a std string and then call C str to convert the std string to a C style null terminated string so S2I that I'm using is from the C++ standard library provided by the string header so it goes with std string and it converts a std string to an int it's uh, it may use the underlying A2I implementation that's unspecified that's implementation detail okay so back to um, the parser here so we are using the parser for the very first time and one of the features of SIMD JSON if you want to write code that can run on a variety of CPU architectures like for instance a desktop application where you don't get to dictate what kind of CPU your customers buy or a server farm where the CPU may be you know older or newer and you can't know which instruction set extensions are going to be available at the time that you run so SIMD JSON has the ability to be compiled with runtime dispatch which is how you get it when you obtain it through VC package if you know that you're going to target specific CPUs with a specific instruction set you can compile SIMD JSON in such a way that it says my set of supported architectures is this specific set and I don't need to uh, dynamically query but in our case we're using dynamic dispatch and so in the uh, x86 instruction set or I guess I mean does anybody really not run 32-bit code anymore 60-bit code 64 the x64 instruction set as well there's an instruction called CPU ID it's a slow instruction but when you call it it gives you back information about the CPU uh, and the set of extended instructions that are available on that CPU now what they've done is they've written uh, in this CPU ID function here we'll step into it it is let's get the thing over here uh, when you step into this this is um, a function that they've written that wraps the intrinsics functions so an intrinsics function is a way that you can expose these extended instructions to your your program without you having to write as assembly language directly so however there's one way to call an intrinsic from MSVC and then there's another way to call it from GCC and then if you know as a fallback they have a piece of inline assembly code here so um, I like this idea that they want to call this generic functionality it's exposed in different ways in different compilers so they've localized that to one place so that your code isn't sprinkled with you know if def GCC you know in a hundred different places it's just in this one place and they've um, got their own little wrapper function here so if we step into it I'm in the MSVC case of course because I'm running on Windows compiling with MSVC so they call this is the intrinsics function and if I do control F11 we can step into the assembly code and we can see that the intrinsics function expands into 
some code to load the appropriate registers with uh, the input arguments and then it calls the CPU ID instruction and then it takes the result of the CPU ID instruction and stores it in the output arguments for this function and then their little wrapper takes the result of um, the, the output from this intrinsics function goes into this CPU info array so then they take the elements of that array and copy them back out into the parameters supplied by the caller and you can see that you know this one is a little bit different in that um, this uh, function they can pass the pointers that came from the caller directly to the, in the GCC intrinsic Otherwise, you know, down here when they're doing it via assembly manually, they, can, they have to do something a little slightly different. But what's nice is they've kind of wrapped that up into a single function that you can call. Uh, and it hides the differences between the intrinsics functions. Um, and the rest of this is just, it's just building a mask of uh, a bit flag, rather, a bit bit set, bit flag, bit flag set, how, I don't know how you want to say it. It returns a word that encodes all the supported instruction set extensions on the CPU on which we're running. And then it's just simply going to walk over the available implementations and find one that matches. And if that matches, it's going to return that implementation. And it's doing this the very first time we're doing anything that needs uh, par actual parsing where we're going to do some kind of operation that is SIMD specific. So the result of what we just did is we just went through get available implementations and detect best supported that called that CPU ID instruction. And now it's going to assign it to the result of get active implementation. So that looks a little weird that you call a getter on the left hand side of an assignment and if we drill into that uh, sorry we had to go over here we see that what uh, what's happening is that the getter is returning a reference to an atomic pointer of implementation an atomic pointer is just a way for them to wrap a stood atomic of T star so that they can basically set a singleton in a thread safe manner. So their code is fully thread safe and the only thing that's a little bit tricky is setting this initial implementation so they've got that uh, wrapper around a stood atomic so if we step in here we are now in get active implementation it's got you know an atomic pointer singleton here thing it's going to return that we step in again now we're in <coughs> the assignment operator for this atomic pointer class that they've written and that, if you know, if you step into it again, now we're in the assignment operator for stood atomic. So assign the stood atomic, assign their atomic pointer. We just evaluated this stuff on the right, and now we will return the result of that assignment, which gives us our pointer to the best implementation for the CPU on which we're running. So we just did we just did that. Set best. We just did that in the debugger. So if I step in, now we're in <coughs> excuse me. Let's take a sip of water. Uh, now we are in create DOM parser implementation um, which is just getting an implementation of the DOM parser. We can step out of that. And step out of that. We've just done this whole expression. So now we've created uh, the parser. And we're going to 
ensure some capacity on the parser and now we're inside this parse into document where you've got a complete implementation that's ready to go and when we get down here to implementation parse if I step into this we are <coughs> gonna step into stage one and if you can, I don't know if it's kind of might be small for you to see but we are in Haswell.cpp so this is the Intel Haswell microarchitecture implementation of the stage one or it's the implement the Haswell implementation of the whole parser and we are doing the stage one process which is the process whereby it's going to scan through all the input text in chunks using SIMD instructions to mark all the interesting parts and find all the uh, syntactically relevant characters in the input text and then it's going to uh, run over those locations in the input text and build the tape in stage two. So if we just keep going here, we'll step in a little bit more till we get down to something interesting. A uh, little this uh, buff block reader. So that's the reader that's going to present the SIMD stream with chunks of input in blocks. And then we're going to go through this uh, indexing code. We're going to create that. Okay, now we're going to do index step of step size. And step size here is 128. And so now we're in step 128, do a block, and it's going to build some. SIMD 8x64s and let's see if we can get down to an interesting I've ah okay so now you can see where it is using an intrinsic that's specific to the Haswell microarchitecture so the set of stuff that's available on Haswell microarchitecture this is an intrinsic function. Uh, it is coming from on on MSVC. It's going to come from, I believe, intrin.h. But this is basically doing a load from a pointer into a SIMD register. So it's going to load multiple values into a SIMD register. So uh, starting at this pointer, and I think I stepped past it. Yes, I did. But uh, let's go back here. Did I lose it? I lost the location. It, it's using the Haswell intrinsic function to load data into the SIMD register so that it can start processing it in chunks. And the rest of the algorithm is going to proceed similarly where, ah, okay, here we are back again. So it, it, it's going to keep loading chunks and scanning them to, and as it builds that mask operation of all the interesting characters and runs the character classifier and does all the other stages in, all the operations in stage one of the parsing, and then stage two, it will take the result of stage one and process over that to generate the tape. And what I like about this library is um, it's, it, it's a little bit difficult to follow in the code uh, just simply because they've added so many implementations for the different uh, microarchitectures of x64 and they've got uh, implementations that can target some of the uh, vector extensions in the SIMD vector extensions in other CPU architectures like PowerPC, I believe they have, and um, there's an instruction set, instruction set extension specific to AMD that they also have support for. So, you know, as they add more and more, it gets a little bit more complicated. But in the end, I think there's uh, lessons to be learned here if you're to implement 
SIMD functionality in your own application and you want to leverage the mechanism of dynamic dispatch to adapt to whatever CPU you are happen to be running on and uh, combine the idea of these uh, algorithms as higher level steps and they're combined together through template specialization so that's their you know base 8 numeric class and so on where these specializations adapt the different steps to the different microarchitectures so this particular uh, intrinsics function here is only called for you know specific CPU architectures that can support that and they've got uh, uh, they've got um, other variations of the same data structure and same algorithm encapsulated in such a way that um, each particular combination is tailored to a particular CPU microarchitecture but you through the use of templates, they uh, can target multiple microarchitectures where the, when the code is similar. So th they don't have to write everything from scratch over again for each microarchitecture. But due to the nature of these different combinations of CPU microarchitectures and you know some the, the extension sets, they kind of stack on top of each other. But um, you want to use the the most uh, the most data parallel instruction set extension that is available. So, for instance, Haswell has the 512 bit registers. So you want to use those instead of using the uh, previous instruction set extension that was using only 256 bit registers or 128 bit registers or 64 bit registers so that you can get more parallelism but in order to exploit that fully you need to have a certain amount of combinatorial combination going on and that's what they've done with their template classes I haven't reverse engineered it fully um, but I, I do find it a, a useful approach to what they've done here now, they didn't use another SIMD C++ library like um, there's a couple out there. There's a vector library, and uh, there's a, an interesting talk that was just published at CPP Now. Uh, it was published on YouTube recently, uh, covering these different C++ libraries for SIMD programming. They've chosen to use no layer underneath them so the SIMD JSON library stands alone and they've implemented everything all the way down to calling the intrinsics functions themselves and that means that all they're leaving to the compiler is register allocation so they've not they're not using automatic vectorization from the compiler for their algorithms their algorithms are essentially just slightly above assembly language by using these intrinsics functions as I say the CPU gets to do register allocation but that's about it uh, or the compiler rather gets to do register allocation but that's about all that the compiler is doing um, and the rest of it is keyed to their own use of uh, wide data types like this you know double underscore m 256 I represents a 256 bit wide register um, and the rest of the algorithm is stacked on top of their template classes that they've used to you know, squish out as much duplication as they can but there's going to be differences um, so like I said I haven't they they have good documentation on the user level API of their library but the implementation um, I mean there's some documentation in here you know some comments but it's pretty much you're gonna if you want to steal the implementation and, and do something similar um, it's gonna be a bit of a learning curve to understand exactly how everything is working um, but for its purpose parsing gigabytes of JSON and getting a result back 
that you can traverse quickly from the Dom. It's it's very good. It's being used by many commercial, um, you know, kind of core web infrastructure type companies, um, and that speaks for itself. They if you on their homepage. Let's see back here. And if we go back here. Real world usage. So Google, Node.js, ClickHouse, Microsoft Fish Store. So a, a bunch of places are using it. And that's just the ones that they know about, right? I mean, plenty of people, I'm sure, are using this library and didn't bother to go back and let the SIMD JSON people know that they were using it. So overall, good documentation, which is always nice. Uh, good examples, and we didn't really look at the the documentation on their uh, GitHub page, but this documentation I I've poked through it, and you know, um, you know, it's well written with examples on how to do things. I basically ignored their documentation and just went and wrote what I thought was the obvious thing to do from a point of view of uh, consuming it. In my own code and that was fairly straightforward uh, the only bit about you know maintaining the lifetime of the parser to match the lifetime of the parsed Dom uh, that was commented or not commented it was described in here and I overlooked it at first uh, this parser document and JSON scope so a parser can have at most one document open at a time and the lifetime of the document should match the or the lifetime of the document should match the parser that it came from so that the parser doesn't you know disappear out from underneath the dom and have a dom that points to things that don't exist um so good library works really well um i like the fact that as i was developing if i made some kind of stupid mistake it would throw an exception with a, a useful message in there um my little program <clears throat> that I wrote to convert the tab separated value file to a JSON value or a JSON file um, the input TSV files were pretty wild uh, in the sense that they had you know on things I didn't expect there to be in there like there was backslashes in some of the text fields I didn't expect that uh, because it's a TSV file double quote characters were uh, escaped by doubling them up so I had to replace two double quotes with uh, an escaped single quote there were some fields that had tabs and then there were some other other fields that had weird control characters in them uh, I just dealt with that by dropping them some I, I don't know why but some of the fields had control K characters in them I think it's just because over time they allowed any arbitrary user input to get injected into their database without sanitizing the user input first um, and th there was a little bit of manual editing that I did because some of the text fields had embedded carriage returns and that meant that uh, you know get line didn't obtain the whole record because it was split across multiple physical lines I just used VI to drop out those. Um, well, I did a little bit with VI, and then I did the rest with a sed script because it got a little bit tedious to do manually. Uh, I, I wrote a sed script to just combine those lines all into one physical line uh, so they didn't have to do more fancy parsing here in my conversion tool. Um, and that is plenty of talking about this library. As I said, there's other videos going into the details of the library that you can find on YouTube and there are papers on their website that describe the algorithms in more detail if you're curious about how they do that bitwise masking and combination in order to identify you know things like escaped quotes inside strings and which uh, quote characters mark the end of strings um, it's pretty interesting um, I wonder if this approach could be applied to more to other parsing problems like parsing email messages or even parsing 
C++, the first phase of C++ parsing, which is turning input text into preprocessor tokens. I wonder if there's applicability there, but uh, I haven't pursued that myself, so. Uh, unless we have any questions, we will wrap it up there. Okay, well that wraps it up for this month and we will see you next month.